Welcome to our final Wednesday Advent Vespers. I'm going to admit that I might be stretching things in this message. I've always been interested in how various stories in the Old Testament get replayed in the New. Scripture does not always repeat itself, but it often rhymes. Many of these parallels are recognized by scholars. This, this one is, to my knowledge, original with me. I'd be interested in seeing what you think. Today's uh, Advent hymns are by the Petersons, a family group bluegrass band from Branson, Missouri. They may not go along with the sermon exactly, but I really like their versions. Hope you do as well. God bless you, and hope you enjoy the service. Jesus Christ is the light of the world, the light no darkness can overcome. Stay with us, Lord, for it is evening, and the day is almost over. Be our light and scatter the darkness, and hear our evening prayer and praise. A reading from Genesis 3. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called out to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some of the fruit, and I ate it. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers, he will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. To the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree, which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat fruit from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Adam named his wife Eve, because she would become the mother of all the living. A reading from Romans 5. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin. And in this way, death came to all people, because all sinned. To be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not charged where anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who was the pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if, by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundance provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. 
A reading from Luke 1. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come over you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. That mourns in lonely exile here Until the Son of God appears Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel Shall come to thee, O Israel
to set that people free from our fears and sins release us let us find our rest in thee is our all strength and consolation hope of all the earth thou art dear desire of every nation joy In the name of Jesus, amen. Our first year in Poland, the students in our English Bible camp introduced us to something I'd never celebrated before, name day. Since Poland is a heavily Catholic country, many people are named after various saints. So that saint's day is your name day. It's kind of a second birthday. The family has a small celebration. They'll often have a cake. Um, th that person will receive some small gifts. Well, talking about name day led to a discussion of names, why their parents picked their names, and stories behind their names. Of the seven kids in our family, I'm the only one whose name was chosen by dad. Uh, my mom picked everybody else. So I'm actually the reversal of my grandfather. He was Edward James, and I'm James Edward. Well, names are very important in the Bible. Names always have a meaning behind them. When Esau was born, he had a head full of hair, so they called him Harry. That's what Esau means. His twin brother Jacob was born grabbing hold of his brother's heel, so they called him Heel, Jacob. Uh, Adam simply means human being. And I guess that's as good a name for any for the first human. Then there is Eve, which means living. Adam gave her that name because she was the mother of all the living. But if you think about it, Mary isn't the mother of the living. She's really the mother of all the dying. Her name is really ironic because Eve was the one who introduced death to the world. In Romans 5, a passage we looked at earlier, Paul says, talks about Adam and his sin. He says, the trespass of the one man and the one man's sin and as a result of Adam's sin, death entered the world and spread to all people because all people sin. But let's not forget that Eve was also very much involved in this sin. When the Lord God confronted Adam in the garden and asked if he'd ate the forbidden fruit, Adam said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me of the fruit and I ate. Yes, that's blame shifting, but it's also partly true. Moses says the woman took the fruit of the tree and ate it and gave some to her husband, and he also ate it. 1 Timothy 2, Paul says the woman was deceived and became a sinner. So yes, death entered the world through the sin of a woman as well as the first man. A woman disobeyed God and his command. A woman brought death into the world. So it's kind of ironic that there, right there at the end of Genesis 3, uh, the Lord, you know, tells Adam, dust you are, to dust you will return. There's the son of death. And she, he turns around and calls her Eve, the mother of all the living. But she's rather the mother of all the dying. And it didn't take long for death to rear its ugly head. Adam and Eve's oldest son, Cain, kills his brother Abel in Genesis 4. 
A little bit later in Genesis 4, Cain's great-grandson, Lamech, boasts that he kills a man for insulting him. Turn the page to Genesis 5, and there's the first genealogy. Now, reading that, a lot of people wonder whether or not these people actually lived that long. Adam, 930 years. His son, Seth, 912 years. The oldest man in the Bible, Methuselah, 969 years. Well, I don't know how literal to take those numbers. But I look at the end of each section, and that's very literal, because it has this constant refrain, and he died. No matter how many years he lived, each one of them died. And then comes Noah and the ark and the flood and death destroys almost everything and everyone. Paul's right in Romans 5, death reigns. Death reigns in our world. For the moment we are born, we begin our march to the grave. The death rate is 100%. Some will die before they should, some will die of disease, some will die of accidents, some from national causes, some in other ways. But one thing's for sure, we will all die. Folsom Funeral Home is one of the sponsors of our 5K each year. And the first year, they, they gave us a logo for the back of the shirt, has their name on it, and says, see you at the finish line. Because yes, they will see us. Well, Romans 5, Paul points out that we need a new Adam, one who can undo the sin of the first. But thinking about it, it seemed to me that we also needed a new Eve, a second Eve. Eve in the garden became the mother of all the dying. We need someone to become the mother of all the living. And as I got to thinking about this, it occurred to me that in many ways, Mary is the second Eve. Because unlike Eve who disobeyed the Lord, Mary obeyed him. Now, let me be clear. I'm not saying Mary was sinless. Okay, she was a sinner. She failed God in many different times, many different ways. But her obedience at one point made all the difference. When the Gabriel came to her with the news that she was going to be the mother of the Messiah, Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. Now, Mary could have said no. She could have refused. She could have been disobedient, but she wasn't. She heard the angel's words, and she obeyed. And by saying these words, Mary is laying everything on the line, her reputation, her upcoming marriage, possibly her life. Last Sunday, we we looked at Matthew 1 in church, and we saw Joseph's reaction to the news of Mary's pregnancy. Matthew points out that uh, Joseph was a just man, That meant he had good news and bad news for Mary. The good news, he wasn't going to have her stoned to death. He wasn't even going to expose her to public disgrace. The bad news was he was going to divorce her. Oh, he was going to divorce her quietly, but he was still going to divorce her. It was only Angel's intervention that kept him from following through with his decision. As it was, her reputation never fully recovered. When Jesus returned to Nazareth, some of the people referred to him as Mary's son. Mary, not Joseph. The people hadn't forgotten that Mary was pregnant before she married Joseph. And they all knew that Jesus wasn't really Joseph's son. And so they took that and threw it back in his face and in hers. Mary knew this could happen when she heard the angel's words. And she could have decided the risk wasn't worth it. And God would have had to find some other woman to be the mother of the Messiah. But Mary trusted the Lord, and she obeyed him. And she remained obedient through all the other hurts and struggles of her life. When Mary and Joseph brought Jesus to the temple when he was 40 days old, a man named Simeon came up to them and praised God that he, had, that he saw the Messiah. He said that this child would cause the rising and falling of many in Israel. Then... Turning to Mary, he said, a sword will pierce your own soul, too. Mary's heart was pierced many times. When she and Joseph left Jesus in Jerusalem and found him among the teachers. Later on, when Jesus gave her a rather curt answer, when she told him a wedding party had run out of wine. But the worst piercing of all was when her son was on the cross. 
Yeah, Jesus, the mother, Mary, the mother of Jesus, was at the cross. And she suffered with him in his shame and disgrace at being crucified. She hurt as Jesus was laughed at and jeered. And she cried when Jesus gave her into John's care in keeping. Yet she also knew that this was necessary. For just as through the one man Adam, death came into all people, so now through her son Jesus, life would come to all. She remembered the angel's words that Jesus would save his people from their sin. Yes, Jesus would save his people. He would save his parents, Mary and Joseph, from their sin. He would save you and I for our sin. Her son gave his life. He poured out his blood so that we can be God's people. Unlike his mother, Mary, who was obedient in just one thing, Jesus was obedient in all. Unlike Adam, who chose in a garden to disobey the Lord, Jesus, in another garden, chose to be obedient. He went to the cross. He gave himself. We are his own. And that's why I see Mary as being the new Eve. Because through her son, life came into the world. Through her son, we're given a new beginning. Through her son, we are the new creation of God. Mary gave birth to the one who would give life to the world. And by the way, this new obedient Adam, Jesus, he created who, what is now question, the new Eve, his church. As as Eve was the bride of Adam, so we are the bride of Christ. And Paul in Ephesians 5 says that we are a bride without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Christ's church is truly the mother of all the living. For it is in his church we give birth to salvation through the waters of baptism. We nurture faith through the study of the word. We strengthen faith through the forgiveness and absolution. We feed faith through Christ's supper. Mary and her obedience is a picture of the church's obedience as we hear the words of our Lord and follow him. The church really is the new Eve. She is the mother of all the living. Those who live in Christ by faith in his death and resurrection. I think Adam gave his wife the wrong name because she really wasn't the mother of all the living. Through her, sin came into the world and she became the mother of all the dying. And that death still touches us. Thankfully, the Lord sent us a new Adam, his son, who was obedient in all things. He gave us Jesus through this second Eve, his mother Mary. In Christ we are forgiven. In Christ we have a new beginning. In Christ we have a life with God that will never end. That life is given to us through God's word in his church, which is truly the mother of all the living. Put your hope and your faith in Christ, who gave himself for you. Look for the day when he will return and raise you from the dead. And then we, together with Adam and Eve and all the faithful of God, will live with him forever. Amen. Let's read together the Song of Mary. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has looked with favor on his lowly servant. From this day, all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. He has mercy on those who fear him in every generation. He has shown the strength of his arm. He has scattered the proud in their conceit. He has cast up the mighty from their thrones and has lifted up the lowly. 
He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has come to the help of his servant Israel, for he has remembered his promise of mercy, the promise he made to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his children forever. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works come from you. Give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments. Defend us also from the fear of our enemies, that we may live in peace and quietness. Through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us praise the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. <laughs>